Kipchak people um, of the Noongar Nation here in Perth, Western Australia, and I pay my respects to past to elders past, present and emerging. So thank you for joining us today on this absolutely critical topic. What we're going to do is, as usual, I'm going to share some of my thoughts. Um, and then we have two fantastic ARC Laureate Fellows, um, Elaine Holmes and Catherine Lovelock, who are going to share some of their tips. And of course, we will have um, an opportunity for questions. So our usual plan applies. Um, one thing that um, is going to be a little bit different today is that normally I begin with some of the research evidence on whatever topic it is we're talking about. But actually, this is a topic where there's not so much research evidence, or at least I couldn't find any. Um, so we're going to do a bit more crowdsourcing today. So which is why I asked you all to think about your top tip for teaching because I would like at some point in today's discussion for you to share that top tip on the, on, the, on the chat function. So really we're gonna just get everybody's ideas about how to address some of the challenges of balancing teaching with research. I guess what I'd, I'd like to first of all, start off by saying, um, you know, of course we live in a world in universities where there have been a lot of changes happening, you know, compared to the universities um, of old. We've seen changes in funding models in universities. Um, you know, we've seen the growth of large numbers of senior administrators who put in place lots of processes and performance checks and so on. So, you know, you, you might sort of crudely call that managerialism. So we've seen big changes in universities and they flow on to affect the work of all of us. Um, I think sometimes we face ever expanding expectations. So it's not just teaching and research we have to do, we also have to have impact. You know, we have to meet the sustainable development goals. We have to do all sorts of different things. Um, all of the initiatives of the government flow down to affect um, what is expected of academics. We've got more precarious contracts, as many of you would know, many of you will be on. You know, we've got a shift towards students, you know, students being sort of customers. Uh, I put that in quotation marks. Um, and that's a different mindset around students, actually, compared to historically. And also, we were just chatting last night at dinner about how sometimes the autonomy that was once present in teaching has been eroded due to all sorts of different um, factors. So quite obviously, there, there's a real urgent need for some systemic solutions around some of these challenges um, because they play out with burnout. And we've talked about burnout of academics a lot um, in this series. Um, and there's, a, there's another book out on it and there's lots of research on that topic. I did just wanna quickly share with you something I found um, that was published in Nature, I think it's the Nature Career Journal or something, um, about academics engaging in quiet quitting, which is which is a sort of uh, trendy label given to something that we've always known has happened in organisation and sort of when people withdraw from, from organisations. Um, so what you can see there is this, these um, more than 5,000 academics are asked, have you dialed back your work since sort of COVID basically since March 2020. And you can see that 75% of people have said yes. Um, and then what were your main reasons for dialing back, for putting more boundaries around burnout? You can see is the big factor, um, not willing to work overtime that's not paid, not being recognized by the supervisor, not having enough time, no financial incentive, lack of care for um, lack of support for care responsibilities or other. Um, and what activities did you reduce your efforts in? I thought this was sort of interesting. Um, and you can see, you can see conferences is the big one actually, you know, which is sort of sad actually, because that's one of the great joys, I think, of being an academic. Um, uh, but you can also see peer review uh, dialing back on that. You can see committee membership, you can see mentoring, 
Um, and you can also see some dialing back around teaching um, and other. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see whether some of these systemic solutions are taken more seriously, you know, when everybody realises that the work just can't get done because people are pulling back a little bit. So I just wanted to set the scene. Sorry, it's a bit of a miserable introduction. But I, I guess what I just want to flag as we talk about um, uh, as we talk about sort of ideas for teaching, that the context is one in which this is not any individual's fault. This is the context in which, you know, many people are systemically overloaded. So I just wanted to start with that as, as sort of the framing for the discussion today. So what we will, um, we will do today is I really want to, we got, so we had more than 400 and 30 people register for today's session and we got, I don't know, at least 100 questions submitted by, by people, by yourselves. And um, these are roughly the four themes that those questions came in. So what I'm going to do is go through each theme and I'm going to ask you to share a tip if you have one about that theme. Because we're going to do a bit, so we're going to do a bit of crowdsourcing basically for solving uh, not solving, because as I've just said, I don't think we can solve some of these challenges, but supporting each other and trying to make um, some of these challenges that we all face just a little bit more manageable. So these are the four themes. First of all, managing teaching load alongside all of the other things that we need to do. Some, some questions around specific challenges. So for early career researchers or people with small children or, or others. Um, People asking for tips for teaching efficiently or um, automating tasks, those sorts of ideas. And, um, and then fourth, lots of questions about how much priority should I give teaching, you know, in the course of my career. So I can see already people are putting some tips up and we will try to, to, to call out some of those as we go, go through. But let's start with the first theme. So the first theme was just how do we manage teaching alongside all of the other demands? And here's, here's some questions from you guys. How do we maintain boundaries around teaching when we're expected to be innovative, redesign courses, engage with students and so on? How can we find time for research amongst all of this? And then another person asking, how do we do all this while also being ethical and supportive to colleagues, um, to staff and HDRs? especially in a field like mine where external grants are rare and many of us don't have funding for our research. And somebody asked, is research, writing research publications going to become my Saturday job? So lots of questions on this theme. The first thing I'd like to say is I don't think that this is a territory of should. You should do X or you should do Y. I think this is a territory where we can share our ideas and we can share our experiences and we can ask questions. So, and I guess what I'm trying to say there is everybody's different. Everybody's got different experiences and challenges. So there's no right answer here, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So here's some questions from me to you based on my experience in teaching. Is what is expected of you reasonable? And can it be adjusted? Now, it might not be able to be adjusted, but I encourage you to ask that question and to think whether there is any scope to renegotiate or negotiate your teaching um, expectations. So what is your schedule? How many preparations are you doing? Um, actually, someone asked a question, and I'll come, it might be in one of my next slides, saying that um, that, that you know they sort of expecting um, junior people to do more. Um, in, or in fact, the best universities should reduce teaching load for early career people, not the other way around. It shouldn't be that the early career people are loaded up with teaching and the senior people get it easy. Um, it should not be that way. It should be. Um, so here's me doing shoulds. And I said I wouldn't. And but I'm talking about organisations here. Organisations should actually be supporting those um, those um, more early career people with lower loads. And if you don't have that, and you're an early career person, and a new, especially a new early career person, I recommend that you try and negotiate and find out from others 
um, who is getting um, uh, better deals in their universities and use that in your negotiation. So share such and such a university, give a better deal for the early career universities, uh, scholars. Why are we not doing that? I also think, are you sometimes expecting too much of yourself? Are you being a perfectionist? And I did see a little comment in the chat about somebody being a perfectionist. Um, yeah, if one million percent or some large number of perfectionists always feeling the pressure to perform. Um, I use a physical diary to block out my time and keep me on task. So that's a great tip in itself. Um, feel free to lower your standards if that helps you survive. That's, that's my advice. How do you organise your time? Again, um, lots of people try and chunk their teaching. So they have teaching weeks or teaching days or even teaching mornings. And that can be a way, or and, and of course, conversely, a research day or a research week or a research afternoon. And then, of course, managing your time so that you're not responding to students and so on when you do have those research chunks. So looking at how you organise your time. How do you manage student expectations? Um, how do you manage other people's expectations? Are you doing everything you can to manage when students can contact you and how they contact you so that you're not getting those hundreds of emails from students. And we talk a lot about time management in this series. Are you exercising good time management um, habits with your teaching? Are you in control of your teaching prep? You know, um, I think I've shared this story before with this group. Um, you know, I, one of, I was one of those sort of perfectionist over preparers. And my strategy was to not allow myself to prepare until, you know, the day before or even the night before. So then you can't over prepare because you actually don't have time. That was my personal strategy and that's what I needed to do. Um, sometimes it does come out of perfectionism, fear that what if I don't do well? Um, so I guess, you know, reflecting on what is the worst that could happen if, you're giving people some studies that are a bit old or you're just recycling some of your colleagues' material. You know, what is the worst that could happen? Can you substitute? Are you being clever and strategic about your teaching? Can you substitute prepared lectures, which take a lot of work, occasionally with class discussion, review, group activities, guest speakers? Are you using all those sorts of strategies? Have you thought about your due dates for things, making sure that they're staggered? Um, I put, are you correcting your PhD students' spelling? I don't mean that literally, but what I mean is, are you going overboard in some of your supervision? Um, I find myself doing that automatically. I try to stop myself, but I just almost can't. But the point there is, are you, are you going too far with the feedback that you're giving, for example, with the PhD students? So um, I've put this in chat already. This is, um, there's, a, there's a center of teaching um, in California, I think it was, and I found um, some of these tips came, came from there, some of them my own, um, about managing your time as a teacher. So that resource is, is there for you. But really I wanna ask at this point, what tips do you have for juggling teaching, managing teaching, I don't know what the right word is there, balancing teaching alongside all of your other demands. And I'm just going to pick out a few of the suggestions that, that are made, uh, except that 80% good is good enough. That's what we're talking about with, you know, lowering your standards, not being a perfectionist. Um, I divide my daily work hours, says Leah, and always start my day with at least two hours of research and writing time. Um, so that's a fantastic tip, getting in, you know, if that's something that's, you know, we've talked about this as well before, you know, research tends not to be urgent. It's important, but it's not urgent, which means we don't do it. So scheduling in time for what is really important, but not necessarily urgent. And so that's an excellent um, tip there. Um, um, I think that uh, Karen has said, understand my own waves of energy and try to put the ta hard tasks in the top energy level spaces. That's a great suggestion. You know, for me, I'm very precious about what I do in the morning, which is when I've got energy. 
and uh, much less precious about, I, I have meetings in the afternoon, um, right, because, you know, I don't necessarily need um, my full brain for that. Oh, somebody's put get on board with AI, fantastic time-saving tools are available. And I might ask that person, um, which is Eleanor, we're going to talk specifically about tips um, for for AI and stuff. So we might even ask you to be more specific. So thank you guys for sharing any tips. I'm going to go now on to the, the second specific theme that emerged. And this was sort of challenges for people in particular groups. And I guess the, the key groups were the, the first one mentioned there. So this is a question from someone. I'm keen to hear how to navigate the workload expectations when also having young children. For me, three under five. Three under five. I mean, my God, what a nightmare. I've had that as well. Um, so it's, it's wow. How to navigate workload conversations and how to effectively manage workloads. Another question from our ECR, how can we negotiate? Oh, this is the one I was thinking of before. How can we negotiate the balance with our senior staff? As an ECR and someone who's on level B, I do feel there's an expectation that I should be carrying a large teaching load. And this is where I use the should word because I, I think organisations should be doing the opposite of that. So what tips do you have for these sorts of questions for people with specific challenges? Um, one thing I would just say at this point is just some of you are new to the series. We've covered some of these topics like um, staying sane whilst managing homework challenges in a full webinar. So um, feel free to go to that too. And also another relevant one here, I think, is saying no and speaking up. How can we, that was actually one of our most popular webinars ever. Um, you know, how can we um, be more assertive so that we don't end up saying yes to everything and getting completely overwhelmed. I think probably one thought I would have about this specific career issues and challenges and, and recognising everyone's different, but I guess when you get to sort of a, a later point in your career is really realising that things shift and change over time. Um, so things, so that's important. And you don't feel like that when you've got three children under five because you're just in survival mode most of the time. Um, in, incredibly quickly, you move into a time where your kids are growing up and, and leave and stuff. And I guess what I'm trying to say by that is that means you might make choices at certain points in your career that you wouldn't make at other points in your career. And I think that's actually okay. So, um, you know, um, again, this is why I'm not keen on this idea. You should never work weekends, okay? Sometimes in your career, you will have to work weekends. Um, what we hope is you're not doing that for the whole of your career. That's not a sustainable situation. Um, so what I'm saying is just, just recognising that, yeah, there's no hard and fast rules and you have to do what you need to do to survive and that things change over time. So, again, I'm just going to invite anyone who's got any tips or thoughts or philosophies for people who are in these unique situations, how they can survive. And I'm just going to see um, what, oh, I can see some great research-focused AI tool ideas coming up. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, yeah. So establish what the expectations actually are. Some of the power of the university is harnessing our own need to get it right by not telling us what right is. So we take on too much out of fear of getting it wrong. I have a five-year plan of what I intend to do. And if things come up that don't fit, I don't do it. And thank you for sharing that, Karen. That's about really being strategic and, and goal-focused and prioritising. Uh, just seeing if there's any others. Um, yeah, so someone's just mentioned that having to look after uh, a, a parent at a particular time means, you know, you're going to have to dial back. And, and, that, and of course, that's the thing. These are times when you must dial back. So sometimes you might be surprised if you ask for additional support. I think we sometimes think we need to do it all when, in fact, there are resources around to help. And that's a great observation. Um, yes, somebody child raising tips. Um, enjoy the time they will be 18 before you know it. And that's, I think, what I was partly trying to say with things change. 
and they feel like they won't change if you've got three children out of five, but they do and they change quickly. So, um, and I have to say, I do remember interviewing female laureates and I had a really profound interview with a, a senior laureate and it's actually in the, it's on the website and she, she actually cried when I talked to her because she had such a sense of regret of not spending more time with her kids when they were young. And she really was saying very strongly, I wish I'd done it differently. Now, that doesn't apply to everyone. I understand that. But that's what she, she shared. So, so that's the second theme. Let's go to the third team. And I think, um, I, I think I think it was Eleanor put some great tips about using AI. And, of course, we got ChatGPT and someone made the joke last night, you know, we use ChatGPT to mark all the assignments generated by ChatGPT. And um, so, you know, using these tools is important. Um, but also things like reading student drafts, marking. Has anyone got any tips um, just for doing things really efficiently? Um, and I'm just going to give you just a couple of seconds to share. Uh, work in teams if you can. Um, that's also a great idea, you know, um, be guest lectures for each other and things like that. Um, yeah, it's a good time to ask for help, somebody said, because it's the end of year and, and there's there can be money sometimes left in the pot. Can this chat be, um, chat be shared after the seminar? It absolutely is. So whenever we save the recordings, the chat is all, um, I think the, the chat is um, saved as well. So it's there. It doesn't go away. Um, alternative feedback rounds with co-supervisors is, is a great idea. I sometimes place a timer on. That's a nice idea. Would that be marking, Leanne, or something that you're doing like that? Um, that's I use Microsoft Power Automate to automate a um, repetitive administrative process. So look, some great tips there, and we will make sure the chat is available. I'm sure it is, but um, so that you guys can um, share them. One tip when I looked up this um, teaching centre uh, uh, for, they, they talked about the importance of seeing if you can integrate your research and teaching more. And I think that's a great suggestion. Um, they have this little matrix, uh, which I won't talk through, but it's in the slides, which will be put up online you know, of, of how you can do that. And they actually give little tips for each part of the matrix. Um, and just in the interest of time, I won't go through all of them, but I did really like one of them, which was this one, uh, where my cursor is, each year share with students a body of work produced by a previous group of students and ask them to make improvements and additions to it. Repeat this process until publishable materials are produced. <laughs> that, that one might only apply to more advanced students. Uh, but, but look, there's a whole bunch of tips there and I have put the that where I got these resources from in the chat, but also they will be on the slides. And we will put up, re, um, someone is asking, how do we get to the previous uh, webinars? We will post the link for you in this chat in, in just a moment. Uh, so we've shared some of those tips. And I just want to finally come to sort of thinking about this from a more career perspective, because we had a lot of questions like, should you, should you care about your teaching? You know, does it really matter? Isn't it all about research? And again, this is a real historical shift that's happened with universities to sort of shift away from the teaching side of things to focus on the research side of things. Um, so someone says, you know, is being teaching focused detrimental for career progression? And actually, I shared with you this little article here from Science, and it's actually a, 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 from a, a woman who explains how she actually loves teaching and she's really good at teaching. But actually, that led to various faculty giving her advice about don't be too good at teaching because it will hurt your research career. Um, so have a little read of that article. Um, and But actually, what that person goes on to talk about in the article is actually how her teaching made her a better researcher. So she talks about in the, so what she learned was that what she learned over time, the best way to teach people who she was teaching was not through didactic lectures, but through discussions and problems and all that sort of thing. And she said, in the lab, I adjusted my mentoring style to match the teaching approaches that she'd learned had, had worked well, 
leading with empathy and providing individualized support. And my team exploded with productivity. So there's an example of someone who found a great synergy between teaching and research. So I, I just wanted to say at this point, it doesn't have to be teaching or research. It can be both. And both can work very, very successfully. It can be either as well. So there's lots of different ways of being a successful academic. One of the things I think is sometimes um, teaching gives you things that research does not and vice versa. So sometimes I think they complement each other in really nice ways. So in research, we're often dealing with long timescales, lots of rejection of our papers, etc. In teaching, we often get immediate positive feedback, for example. Um, you know, so we can feel like we're making a, a, a difference more quickly sometimes with teaching. It depends, I recognise, according to what students you're teaching. But so I think sometimes they can work really nicely together because they give you different things. What's your perspective on teaching and research across a career? What's your philosophy? Um, and someone says, I thought that COVID might have reinforced how our students are so important to our universities. But I feel the emphasis on research for promotion has returned stronger than ever. And this is, you know, I think a common experience that, that research is prioritised. And this is where hopefully that systemic change of having promotion pathways for people that are more teaching oriented, you know, it can be really important. And I know that our university has, has some of those pathways. Um, I keep a reflective journal where I document tasks I've completed or been involved in during the month with one note for evidence. <laughs> That's so important. Sometimes I think if you don't write it down and you forget what you've done, you know, it doesn't count, which is actually a ridiculous mindset, just to, to be clear, but sometimes it feels a bit that way. Right, guys, well, that is all that I have to share about um, teaching myself, but there is a fantastic array of comments, and I wish I had time to, to call them all out there. Um, at this point, I would love to introduce our two panellists today. And first up, we have um, ARC Laureate Fellow Professor Elaine Holmes from Murdoch University. And um, she is a computational biologist um, and an amazing researcher, a highly cited uh, scholar. Um, and she's going to share with you some of her tips. And then we will go to ARC Laureate Fellow Catherine Lovelock, who is also a biologist, I think. Uh, which is very unusual to have two people from a similar discipline, um, but she's from the University of Queensland and her research focuses on climate change and you can see um, some of the fantastic things that Catherine has been doing. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point and I'm going to pass you over to Elaine, who is going to share some of her thoughts about the challenges of juggling teaching and research. Thank you, Elaine, over to you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so I'm going to start with a disclaimer that I really still, even at this point in my career, often get it very, very wrong. So it's, a, it's been a, a career long struggle to maintain the right balance between teaching and research. And also, obviously, family time and, and generally having a life. Um, and if you look at the statistics, we all know that the stats show that women are less assertive in the work environment in general. Um, for example, out of 50 students I've graduated or taken on a, a, as postdocs, there's only been, ever been one woman who's asked me and has said to me, that salary is just not enough. And I, that was so surprising to me and so refreshing. I thought because I often get it from the, the men, but not, not from the women. So, and the same goes for duties so very very often people will say if it's a man they'll often say to me I really can't cope with this I need more time to do x y or z whereas in general gross generalization but in general women just tend to put up with it and take on more and more duties until they do reach breaking point whether that's the teaching side or the research side and I think I think in, in the chat line, there was somebody who said, just say no. And I think this is a really key point in balancing teaching and research and 
very often we don't just say no, we feel we have to do it. So one of the things I've learned is that really you have to you have to prioritize what means a lot to you, not what others think you should be doing, but what means a lot to you. Is it important to you to be the best teacher ever? Is it important to you to be the re best researcher ever? Or bearing in mind you can't probably be uh, be the absolute best at both, give your absolute best to both at the same time. What's your balance? What do you want your balance to be and what can go? So a lot of the time, I think we get extra, we get external requests, a lot of journals, new journals popping up and you get requests for reviewing articles, a lot of extra things that maybe 10, 20 years ago weren't common. We had, you know, teaching regulations, we had what was expected in research and there really wasn't, the internet has given us so many really valuable AI tools, but it's also meant that our privacy is more invade, ever more invaded. You know, your, your students can reach you any time of the day or night. You have journals asking you to review or uh, papers, grants, for example. So one of the things I started doing was to have internet downtime or um, just turn off the, the, the social media and the emails and not look at them because with constant popping up, you have this assignment to do for teaching or, or um, could you just review a grant proposal? I think, I think you need to protect your time and decide what, what it is you want to do and how you're going to do it and be really firm about sticking to that. And yes, you might need lots of things for your CV, but you don't have to review everything. You don't have to review every single paper. You can, as some people have suggested, form, form teams, co-teams with, with your, your co-workers, you know, and, and divide up the work um, in terms of uh, in terms of, I think Sharon made a comment, are you, are you checking your PhD students' spellings? Well, Again, I think that's that's somewhere where you can really engage the younger members of your team. So very often, if students don't mind sharing their work, you can get their co-PhD students or even master students to read through and say, does it make sense? What questions would they ask? Are there any typos? But but also the more meaningful things than, than, than the typos. And I have noticed over the last, particularly over the last decade, that because of the way we've changed teaching in general there seems to be a lack of inclination to try things in the students whether it's to do with confidence or just the way uh, we've taught and spoon feeding a lot of times students do expect you to be there and spoon feed them and of course you can't if you're trying to teach undergraduates you're trying to run your research and you have your research students so what I found really useful was if I formed teams around theme areas in the research and put two or three students onto the same broad theme, but obviously with their own projects, they start to regulate themselves. So somebody who's very active and self-motivated will sort of pick up issues and help in teaching the others. And at some point, that student's going to say, hey, why don't you get off your backside and do something independently? And then it's, it's really quite good because that sentiment's coming from a peer and not from, you know, not from the teacher who could be seen as, you know, bullying or picking on, but it's sort of, it's coming from those peers as saying, I can do it, why can't you? I'm helping to help, but you've got to do your bit. And I think, I think making your students, whether it's undergrads or PhD students, allowing them to feel a little bit of a responsibility doesn't hurt. And uh, definitely don't feel bad for saying no. One of the one of the things I've noticed as well throughout my career is I, I sort of share responsibility with a male colleague. Now, when it comes to promotions or allocation of, of research projects or research money, he will look at the people and he sees the people who come to his door, knock on his door and are really loud. Look what I've done. I've done some great work. And I've always wondered why he didn't see the efforts of the very quiet ones, could be men or women, but the, the people who weren't going and knocking on the door every five minutes saying, hey, I've got something amazing. And I, I noticed this pattern in a lot of people. So 
it's the people who really emphasize what they've done and what they're doing that tend to get noticed rightly or wrongly it shouldn't be like that but it is so i would advocate for you going to your um admin the senior admin the senior leadership and so saying you know this is going really well look at this research or look what we've done in innovation for the teaching here and if you have some issues you you feel you've been given too much teaching or you haven't got a fair share of grant money or what it or internal grant money whatever it is it's good to go to the leadership and say i have a problem with this but not just i have a problem when you go you need to have a backup solution you say so maybe i don't feel i can do all this teaching but i've noticed that these two courses teach a lot of the same things. Can we combine them and reduce the teaching hours or, or come up with some sort of solution? And very often I've found people are receptive to that. I think one of the single biggest re regrets or, or burdens in, in my career life is the fact that I am totally disorganized. And it wasn't until this year, having had both my, my teenage children diagnosed with ADHD that they they said to me mom go and get tested I said why what's it going to do so I did go and get tested and I found I do have ADHD I am very disorganized find it very very difficult and so all the time I've left things to the last minute and I, I noticed somebody put in the chat something about promotions it's difficult to go for promotions and you've got a heavy teaching load I think the key is prepare as you go along really try and put in even those if you have your you know even the, the tasks might not be urgent but spend 10 minutes on your cv or, or 15 minutes every week just update it so it's handy you never know when you're going to need that whether it be for a grant pr proposal or for career promotion and again you know um, I think being seen by the leadership team in what you're doing in terms of your teaching or your research also helps build up your case. Thanks, think, Elaine. I'm going to stop you there or just allow you to share one last tip, if you like, just because of time. Um, what was your last tip? Last tip, learn to give honest feedback to your researchers. So don't be too nice. Just like we don't say no, we don't feel we can be honest give honest feedback in a nice way but the more you can get people to buy in and come up to their their best standard the better or the easier life you're going to have thank you so much elaine i think there's so much gold in what you've said uh, you know um i especially love that prepare as you go you know and a few people have said that in the chat you know keeping records of what they're doing and what they've achieved and what they've done so lots of gold in there thank you so much um, we will go now to, to Catherine. Oh, and I can see you, Catherine, and I'm surprised um, just because we were struggling before um, to be able to see you, but you've sorted yourself out. We can see you. And so over to you. Welcome and love to hear your thoughts about this challenge of, of juggling. Somebody in the chat said balance isn't the right word. I agree. Um, juggling, <laughs> dealing with, don't know what the word is, um, teaching alongside all the other demands. Uh, thanks, Sharon. And Thanks, Elaine, as well. Um, uh, okay, so, you know, like what I want to start, I suppose the same as Elaine, that I don't think I've mastered it all yet. Um, and maybe you just never do, and that's okay, you know. And um, I, I also want to, to emphasise that everybody's experience is so individual, right, because of who you are, because of your personal circumstances, your family, your friends, your work environment. So it's very hard to generalize. And I think what you've got to do is just, you really have to just do the best with what you've got, you know, and work it as well as you can. And I think all these tips are great because, you know, something's going to resonate for you somewhere. So I suppose um, for teaching, my, some of the things that I've learned over time is one, I, I, I try and, I, well, I'm not precious with my teaching content. I share, share, share. And, um, you know, if you're starting teaching, go find somebody, go find a friend who you can share content with or, you know, use the textbook content and modify it. You know, take shortcuts, right? Because I see the teaching and improving teaching over time is really incremental. 
So don't try and do it all year one. You know, no, you're going to teach this course for maybe five years if you're lucky. You know, some university, we, we go through phases where you might get changed what you teach, you know, every couple of years, which drives you bonkers. But, um, you know, take an incremental approach uh, rather than, you know, like somebody once told me, you know, teaching's a black hole. It's easy to fall in it. Your, your job is to stay outside on the rim, you know, and not fall down into this sort of big sack of time that all feels so immediate, as Sharon said, but really it's not. So take an incremental approach. I also agree with a lot of people on the chat. You've got to ring fence it. You've got to put a fence around teaching. This is a part of the avoiding the black hole. You've got to put a, a fence around your teaching time and allocate the rest of your time for other things. It had came up, you know, here and there in the chat and elsewhere. And I say examine your assessments because what takes a whole lot of time is assessments. And it's also a bit like commuting, at least for me. It's just totally ick time, right? And so, <laughs> like, really examine what you're asking the students to provide and then try and minimise or try and design your assessment to minimise the time that you're going to have to do assessing it, right? And I think looking at your assessment carefully is important. And then I suppose we get to the, um, you know, you've got, the whole thing is to try and, if you want to free up more time for research, you got to, you know, like <laughs> minimise other um, impacts, right? So you have to teach, and let's say you're going to be a great teacher someday and it's an incremental approach. For your research, you really need to invest and you need to invest early, you know, and keep going. One, because like there's, you sort of get penalised really by not having a continuous output almost, right? So that's a difficult thing, but it seems to be true. So um, that means minimising other demands and also I say for your own sanity, try to reduce your stress. So I'm a mum of two kids my children were born when I was at a research only institution, which has different demands and things. But then they were little when I was, you know, started at the University of Queensland. I think they were one and four. And um, that was kind of tricky. And one thing that really reduced my stress was getting, getting daycare that was great that you were comfortable with, whether that's, you know, friends and family helping you out or not but it was really important to reduce my own stress because I used to get so stressed about um kid you know what the kids were doing so you know like um I thought the daycare you know having you know attending to that is a really helpful one. and maybe you get you need other people to help you do that you know it seems to me I've relied through my career a lot on my partner who's always been supportive on my friends who have had some amazing people put in some time for me and um, and colleagues who've just, you know, gone to bat for me big time. So, like, it takes a, a village, you know, almost. Right? It takes all of your friends and family kind of to, to get there. And I, I think working with people who you know are going to back you is also really um, a good choice to make, you know. So, uh you know, careful about who you sign up with, I suppose, in terms of uh, collaborative arrangements, you know. So one thing that we have talked about um, a little bit was, um, you know, other tasks, because we all get evaluated on teaching, research and service, all right? And I think this is a, a place where it's particularly important to remember that you can say no, because women, you know, whether... We, some some of us, well, Elaine says she's very disorganised, but um, many people are really, really uh, competent, you know, great at parallel processing, great at doing seven things at once because basically you're looking after the kids, cooking dinner, doing your research, teaching, blah, all at the same time, right? So you're good at that stuff. And um, But, you know, saying no to some big service roles, uh, I would evaluate them very carefully about what they're going to do for you versus you becoming the academic housekeeper. So I really feel that this is a term that I've, you know, thought about a lot because I think I've been trapped as an academic housekeeper at various times in my career. And, um, you know, if I'd had any sense, I perhaps might have 
said, perhaps I don't need to do that job, right? Or perhaps ask me when my children are, you know, X and X age. Don't ask me now, you know. So I think um, I think that's a really important thing to do. Look at what your look at what your service roles are. Look at what your service roles of your um, your your other colleagues are, and decide which role you want that is going to be easier on you given your situation, right? So if you have three kids under five, you do not want to be head of TNL or the postgraduate coordinator. No way. You know, and so I think you have to have a really good um, grasp about what those roles are before you say yes, right? Because they're going to take your time, and really, you know, it, to stay in research is hard. You know, there's a there's a reason why all of you know Sharon's probably shown you the data. You know, after level B, it gets really hard for women to hang in the game, and I'm sure some of it is this academic housekeeping stuff and basically we're all too nice and say yes when we shouldn't right so um Thanks. Catherine I'll I just ask you it. to share one more tip oh you finished or one no, more? That, oh, you know, thank that, you so much and look that academic housekeeping is such an important point because what we also know from research is that women don't get rewarded for it it's because it's taken for granted that that's what women should do so we don't even get usually the the benefit from it either we get penalized if we don't do it but we don't get rewarded for doing it so I think it's really good and thank you so much again for your insights um, so we're going to go leap straight into questions now so Annika um, is um, uh, is my PhD student Annika Mertens and she has been monitoring the chat and she's going to fire away with some questions to the panel thank you though yeah. in the meantime Catherine and Elaine <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for the great participation in the seminar. The chat has been very fruitful this time. I tried to read everything. Um, I did not manage to follow <laughs> up on everything. So excuse me if I'm not uh, picking up all your comments, but there have been great um, tips uh, shared um, with each other. And also people ask whether the chat will be available afterwards. So yes, definitely. Uh, you can re-rate all these tips that you gave each other. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, one thing that we haven't yet, like we we talked about it as a side sentence, but maybe something we can go a bit more deeper into is marking and the um, burden of marking and how whether you guys have tips um, on how to do it more efficiently or how you deal with it. Um, maybe Catherine, you want to go first? Yeah, so you know, obviously these days, multiple choice question, multiple choice is not um, a thing, right? People don't really like it. Uh, so you have to come up with other um, cleverer ways. You know, I try and structure questions such that if there's three points in an to answer them, you know, to to get the correct answer, that it's very clear what those three points would be. You know, so then I, I spend less time sort of like trying to understand what the heck the students trying to say you know like that kind of thing I also use a lot of interpretive um, um, so it'll be something like look at this graph and describe what's happening in it and then um, you know infer so they're, they're sort of more straightforward or something uh, so that they're easier to mark like I, I try and avoid um, essay questions if there's an essay question I often ask them to accompany that with a diagram mm. uh, because I'm not really, you know, like I want to be able to mark rapidly if I have to do it that way. That's, yeah, and there's some of the, there's some of the things that you can do if you can't reduce it to a multiple choice. Yeah, Elaine, would you like to share some other thoughts? I uh, agree totally with Catherine. Uh, making the questions clear and easy to answer and not open ended is a good way. But also, I think the, the other thing I would say is if you sort of uh, break down the marking scheme for the students, you have some way of incorporating that, then they know what they're supposed to be doing. So if something's worth two marks, you've got a 10 mark question, and something one component is worth two marks, they know they don't spend you know, two pages on, on that. So so giving them the um, a, a better structure also. 
Yeah. Sharon, would you like to add? I think I, the only thing I would just add is, you know, don't be afraid potentially to negotiate for more help with marking as well. It's a task that can be outsourced to PhD students or others. So don't be afraid to see if that's possible. Um, again, it's this question of we don't ask for things sometimes. So if you've got a lot of marking, you might want to negotiate with getting some help. I think that's a great tip. Thank you, everyone, for sharing uh, all of this. Um, then something else we touched upon very quickly as well uh, is IA as AI, sorry, AI as um, assistant. Um, are you using any of them? We had a great comment in the chat. It was way more up, but there were some uh, AIs that were summarized that we can use. Are there um, any you guys are specifically using and can you recommend some of them? Uh, Catherine? No, I'd have to defer to the uh, to the experts in the in the room and on on the chat. You know, I have been I've been involved in things like MOOCs, right, where basically you become a video and then we just do the live stuff in the lab, right? So they're sort of like minimizing your upfront time, making it more sort of interesting for the students, but never no AI involved. How about you, Elaine? Sharon, maybe? <laughs> uh, not on not so much on the teaching side. I found that ChatGBT and some of the other engines are amazing for creating the lay summaries, for example, for grant proposals and in research uh, or for um, all the softer sections of the, the research proposals and also for doing a preliminary uh, research search, a, a literature search. So I think, yeah, we I think they can really help in the in the the uh, grant proposal writing. I haven't really looked into the teaching yet. But it sounds like the, the people in the chat are way more advanced than me. In that. I was going to say, I'm going to yeah. share what Eleanor has said. She talked about um, elicit.org as an AI assistant that helps with literature reviews, consensus, um, helps automate research flows, and she's got a whole pile here. So um, I recommend trying those. And look, we might even have a whole session on that one day, actually, if it's if it's a topic of interest um, where people could actually show how they've used it or actually show us live how they do it. But I think it's a more broad point, though, too. It is about it is about that efficiency, right? And I think Elaine um, and Catherine, you both talked about the you know the the teaching black hole. And, you know, that's, I think, where self-awareness is important and understanding what's going on in your brain. If you are spending five hours preparing for a one-hour lecture, you know, what is going on? Can you use the textbook, as you suggested, Catherine? Or what it, What can you do just to be more efficient? Um, or do you have to do what I do and leave it till the night before just so that you don't do that? Um, but I think just generally always putting that ruler of efficiency, whether it's AI use or just other strategies. Um, so yeah, good good question. Thanks, Annika. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, actually, we have been covering a lot of the questions already in, in your presentation, Sharon. Um, so I don't want to repeat too many things, but maybe we can touch upon again uh, how to prioritize or what do you like is do you have any tips on what's more important, teaching or like there's not really a an answer to that, I guess. But, yeah, uh, but I actually, I'll just like share take again. Home message on that. <laughs> I'll just share again something someone said in the chat, and they said they don't like the word balance because it implies, yeah. you know. And I, lo I love that comment. I agree. It'd be good. To, we should collectively think of a better term. Um, juggle doesn't quite work for me either because juggle feels nice and smooth and coordinated, whereas I'm not sure it really is like that either. Um, but one thing I do think I use the metaphor of you've got your bucket, you know, and if you want to fit a lot of things into your bucket, you know, imagine if you've got rocks and pebbles and sand, and I actually do this activity, you know, the best way to fit a lot into your bucket is to put the rocks in first, and then the pebbles, and then the sand, you know, and the metaphor there is to prioritise those things that are important. And they're not always urgent, as I said before, especially research, it's not often urgent, except when the revision's due. But you know, um, but we but we've got to get in the habit of prioritizing it because it's important. So for me, it's about getting the big rocks in first is the most important tip I could give in that respect. But Catherine, Elaine, 
time management tips effectively is what we're talking about. Mm, you know what? I let my, um, this is a bit naughty, but I let my heart rule me a bit and I love research. I love it, right? So I see everything else as taking away from it. <laughs> so for me, it's kind of easy to, prioritize the research part which parts of the research you do now that's another question right because it's really easy to get fragmented and take too many projects and you know like you're not really making enough headway on any particular one so um you know you have to decide what you're going to go for basically i think um because you don't have time now you know for a lot of my career i struggled to get enough funding together to keep a lot of things going so i used to say yes to a lot of stuff just because I wasn't certain which one was going to come off, right? You know, you're putting your, your, you're putting bets on a lot of angles, but which one's going to come, you know, down the tube? And, you know, it's a bit stressful. I don't recommend it as a, you know, as a, as a great strategy to do that. It's better if you sort of make your, if you can drive it forward, what you really want to do and what you really believe in. You know, I'm sort of a little bit lucky, I think, and that I'm, I can, um, you know, like if I'm into it, if I'm into doing my research the way I want to be doing it, you know, I'm sitting in front of my computer, people can come in and, my, in and out of my office and talk to me. And I go, oh, yeah, 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 no worries, sure, 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 sure. And I, I'm not listening, you know. So it's sort of like um, a way of, you know, like I'm putting a big fence around um, myself when I'm doing that. So, yeah, I, I would advocate that. You know, if research is important to you and that's what you want to do in the future, you've got to invest. And, you know, mostly it'll probably be because you, you love it. And so everything else is a little bit secondary and that's fine. <laughs> yeah, totally. Elaine, you want to share too? I think because I will always do the things I like to do, which tends to be the research, then I find that I have to make myself a list. I do it on a Sunday and kind of make a list for the week. I never get through it, but I make that list and I do it every morning. And I sort of, I find I have to have an hour or two hours, like somebody said in the chat, where I, I get up earlier than the rest of the family and I just have that quiet time. And I try to do the tasks I don't like then because then I'll always, I'll battle through with the things I like but I'm very easily distracted on things I really hate doing. So so it's it's for me, it's it's really trying to enforce time priorities, but that doesn't work for everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, that. Elaine. And thank you, Annika. I'm going to have to call a halt because we're just about one minute off time. Um, and I just, um, somebody also mentioned my bucket metaphor. You can add water into the bucket. Um, <laughs> and interestingly, Frances is saying she does what she hates first and leaves what she loves last and that's a problem for her so mm -hmm. I think the advice that you guys have shared around you know prioritizing what's important to you what and what you love hopefully those two things coincide is is really um invaluable so thank you so much guys and I know everyone's going to start disappearing because we're right on 12 just to let you know that we will have a completely only questions session for our next women in research and that will be 12th of October um, so myself and Maureen Dollard, another ARC Laureate Fellow, will just be answering questions. So please tune in for that. And I just want to say at this point, thank you to the team in the background, uh, Lainey and Isabel. Thank you so much, Annika. And thank you, Catherine and Elaine, for your incredible insights. And finally, of course, thank you to the wonderful people who've turned up and shared such um, fantastic and diverse ideas. Um, I think there's a great record there that you can all look back on when you're feeling overwhelmed and pick up a tip. Thank you all and look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>